want to be trained to change your life. Thank you. Please encourage my team. If you are clapping, clap very well because they're hitting it on the head. Well done. I'm extremely proud. In fact, I'm in Sky. I'm on a different plane right now. Excellent. So, um, hmm. GT Bank Conference is not a training. No. We will get certificates of attendance. This is more like an, a continuous development Thanks. program. So you attend this and you get information and add it to what you can use. It's like a refresher also for those of you who already have your training. So you come and talks like this remind us of things we already know that we may have stopped practicing and it also helps us know things to start practicing if we already are not. But it is not for you to leave here because I have also come across people who have told me they're behavior analysts. And um, I invited them for the interview and three different people at three different times. They came and the certificate they presented was um, certificate of conferences like the one we're at. And I said, that wasn't, it's from that you're already a behavior analyst. And she says, yes, I'm a behavior analyst. And I said, ah, you know, so it's very important that you know the difference because remember what Dr. Kadiri said yesterday, although she was talking then of doctors, but it also applies to us as teachers. Don't mess with the child's brain. Don't mess with the child's brain. When I did my course, I remember my lecturer crying when he got to the part where he had to tell us that please don't teach what you do not know. Because after you have taught them, you have to go back and unteach it. And he was weeping, a grown man. He says you send them to a different part of the So for you, don't think, oh, this little, that. get all the information, get all the knowledge before you embark on teaching them. I, I always give this example as well about my son. When he was learning the speech therapy at the very beginning in those years, um, so he was being taught how to say thank you and the, somebody had told him thank you, you're welcome I guess they thank you and after saying thank you you're supposed to say you're welcome so every time for about two years we battled with this thing of you just say thank you, you're welcome thank you, you're welcome and I'm thinking no, it's thank you so we had to go back and teach him the process all over again and it took us two years to stop that so imagine the little things you deposit, it takes longer to take them out. So please be very, very careful and understand which ones are trainings and which ones are not. Other thing that um, has been said also is connect with the right people. I couldn't agree more. So yes, there are the online trainings. There are loads of them. There are some that are good and there are some that are bad. It's about knowing the difference. But what is very critical, which Omolala said, is get hands-on experience in addition to whatever training you're getting. It's not enough for you, because I do understand that a lot of us might not have the opportunity to go abroad to learn. A lot of us may not have the places to go to here. A lot of us may not have the resources, but a good number of them are free. All those ones they've said about Patrick's speech that they do on a monthly basis, I don't know that they charge. And if they charge, it's nominal. Do you charge? 1,000 Naira, 2,000 Naira, just to cover the Coke that you're going to drink. So it's very important that you enlighten yourself when you hear about these um, trainings, you go for them and keep getting information because there you get hands-on experience. So it's not enough to do the online, get, back it up with the experience. Then there's also um, the online course. Okay, well, what it just says here is online course is incomplete without the hands-on practical experience. So you help your child across board. Um, next question goes to... I believe a GBK, and it's the social skills, and I think it's even apt for you as a school. What are the social skills we look out for in early years? What is it that we don't see that makes us see that mm, these are red flags? Okay, thank you very much for that question, Ma. Um, for us, the first thing is through observation, we notice if the child is keeping eye contact, if the child is trying to be sociable. You know, communication is really, really important. And sometimes communication is verbal and it's nonverbal. We want to see whether that child has an absence of any kind of social skills. You'd be surprised to see that even babies under the age of six months, you smile at them, the tendency is for them to mimic and imitate and smile back. Where you do not see a child trying to mimic some of the things that you're doing, you start seeing the red flags. Just very, very little things. If the child is not responding to even 
um, the face, the, the, the change, the tone of voice and things like that, you start realizing that perhaps this child is operating in his own little world. So we start to look at those skills. Um, there's some children, however, that have all those social skills and they have all the social graces, but there's still something lacking. So the things that we look at, for example, in Montessori, all the grace and courtesies, the ones that are verbal, the ones that are not verbal, communication skills, those are the red flags that we look at, generally speaking. Thank you very much. So um, Ajibike has said that it's very important to pay attention to eye contact and also communication, verbal and nonverbal. So you're reading body language as well. And these are the things that would help you know if the child is. But how, how would you say, okay, for instance, when you have a child in class, I'll just add to it. So you have a child in class who, when everybody's going in, he's going out. I call them, I call it opposite behavior. So the child is just doing the reverse of what is expected. Or a child that comes to school and stands by the window and is just lining up materials the whole time. So these are all socially inappropriate behavior, or they say stand, he's sitting, he's not even flowing with the gist of what's going on within the environment. So those would be things to look out for, um, with, for social skills. Then there is also, next question now is um, Grace, yes. Incidentally, the question now is to you, and what I was going to say is, can you take us through the developmental stages, when you talk about um, what to look, so it's more of milestones, but it's also the growth of the brain. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the slide, we discussed that. I'll quickly run through it so that we have a very good um, idea of what this panel is all about. You know, take it back to the first slide, please. Okay, now, Look at this family, the one to your left and the one to your right, okay? I want you to look at the right very well. That's the kind of environment I grew up in. Is there anyone that is here with me? Let's be honest, though. <laughs> Area. <laughs> uh, you see them, you know? And then those people, like uh, Mr. Adewale, who grew up in this area. <laughs> Let me see your hand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about inclusion, you find out that kids that grew up, Banana Island, Lekki, Ikoyi, you know them, and the ones like me standing in front of you, Ajegule, Makoko, Ajangbadi, you know what I mean? <laughs> inclusion for these children would definitely be different, isn't it? Good. So we need to have that behind our mind. Where is the child coming from? We determine what type of inclusion program you want to put. Someone that is hungry probably get to school in the morning. You want to know, is the child well fed? Mm. And then a child coming from that environment too, did the child sleep well? You need to know. So these are some of the things that will influence inclusion in a classroom. Next slide, because I'm going to run through it. We are all different, right? If we are all the same, it will be beautiful. Hello, Miss Nigeria. I told her that I'm going to sit beside her so that uh, I will plug myself and then by next year I will be as beautiful as her. <laughs> you know, if we are all the same, it will be boring, right? Next slide, please. This is a typical inclusion class. Now look at the five kids. It's a ballet class, isn't it? One instructor, one environment, right? And probably the same music, isn't it? But look at this child, look at their feet. Are they taking the instruction the same way? And it's the same ballet instructor. And that's one wonderful child. Right? And then you can see the differences. It's clear. Just have this at the back of your mind as teachers, especially that your inclusion class is just like this. This is the typical inclusion class. And you have to deal with all of these kids. You have to deal with them, right? And I'm sure somebody will say, well, I'm my own. 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 I'
I've been teaching for 20 years. I've been teaching this ballet class. <laughs> you know? And we have our teachers talking like that. Yes, you have some teachers. You say, ah, oh, Moti Kamoto Boroto. Kamati Seleti Oboro. Well, well, because of party translates that she translated. You know? So, next one, please. Next one, inclusion has a strong belief that all kids can learn. You must have that belief. If you don't believe that they can learn, you, you don't have any business being a teacher. Next slide, please. And if we believe that all kids can learn, we should have all of this at the back of your mind. What exactly are they expected to learn? Now, for example, a child that is yet to feed him or herself. Do you think teaching reading will be your goal? Good. A child that has not indicated point, look, I they said it yesterday, a child that cannot point to what he or she needs. Is it two I more want minutes? To poo -poo. Two more minutes. I want to poo poo that you want to teach. So say what you want to know then. How are you going to know whether they have learned? You have to put that behind your mind. And also, how do we respond when they have not learned? You walk, moting, call, Are you a house? I've been, I've been teaching you this, this thing as if I'm building a house. Don't say things like that. Next slide, please. So it is important to consider additional needs in early childhood. What are those additional needs? No, now I'm going to her, her questions. Those things you should look out for. Five areas, but they've been you know, divided further to be seven areas, you know, with physical separated to be gross and fine motor. Then you now have uh, moral and values at the, at the seventh one. So you have areas of adaptive and self-help skills. Look out for that. How well can the child dress himself or pull shoelace, use the restroom, feed self? You know, you want to look out for that. You want to look out for cognitive skill. How can the child label objects when you're teaching maths, when you're teaching comprehension? How is the child able to do that? Then you look at physical, gross motor and fine motor. How is the child able to uh, grip pencil? How is the child able to run on the playground? You want to look One at minute. all of that. One minute more. Look at communicative, expressive language and receptive language. You want to look at social emotional interaction, you see? The child will not just start crying. Mr. Adewale said so. When a child is having, uh, expressing a behavior, or ex exhibiting a behavior, there is something. There is no behavior in a vacuum. It's left for you to identify what happened just before the behavior. Next slide, please. Now, why is early years very important? Early years is important because by age five, the brain has attained 90% of its growth standard by age five. So that means all of us here, five years ago, we've grown 90% of our brain. So the remaining 10%, we keep growing it till we return back to Baba God. So please, look at it. At birth, you have 25% of the brain developed. At two years, it's 75%. That's huge. So whatever you want to do at this time, like Mr. Dewale said, don't teach the wrong things. Because if you did, then you have to now go back and use two years to stop. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, early years are critical years. Please, make it count. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grace. So she hits that also. She says that um, it's important that we consider where the child is coming from. So before you decide to prepare a program, you need to know your child. So it still comes back to that thing of know your child, know your child. In banks, I think they say KYC, know your customer. For us, it is KYC, know your child, or KYS, know your students. So it's important that you have a personal connection with them. That's the only time you can determine who they are and um, what they need. And then she also talked about perception of instruction. So we all hear things differently. 
And in the way, yes, in, in the way we hear things, we um, have a different understanding. So some people understand up to be up, whilst others understand it a different way. And then um, she talked about the brain development. That was nice to see. You know that um, formative years are only so many. And when you've passed the formative years, it's harder to learn the concepts that you should learn. You know, we're going to round up now on the questions, um, the presenters talking. We're now going to throw the floor open to questions. But I even wanted to say something. Part of what I have learned from this GT Bank conference, I've learned some new slangs. You know, yesterday I learned the one of, not only because we did here, we never enter town. I didn't know enter town before. Now I've learned Sheleni Monconi, as in in a child. So <laughs> why am I teaching you? I'm building, building. So there are loads of terminology. And no, that one, she, show more age me. Show more age me. You know, so it's nice to know that in addition to all these things that we're learning that are useful to autism, we're also learning what's obtained within our community in terms of local parlance. So at this point, I'm going to throw the floor open and we're going to take questions. And um, your questions will be directed at different people here. So any of us would answer, but I will still select who would answer your questions based on um, their responses. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. How many of you liked Auntie Grace's presentation? Let me see your hands up. Okay, let me give you a short history. Auntie Grace is self-taught. For, I think, Auntie Grace left this country to go, she didn't even go to go and train her. She went to enjoy herself. For the first time, after we have been begging and throbbing and, when? <laughs> when I left, when I traveled out. Yes, and two years ago, <laughs> we've been I begging like, her. I didn't like Grace, go. traveling she said no. and I love Nigeria so much. And she Grace, go, she said no. <laughs> All that she has shared with you, she learned by training herself online, by going, if you say we have train, before you learn Nin, and Grace is the first person to get there. Am I lying? We are all here. Her master's was done here. Her PhD was done here. His Nigeria not good. Nigeria is good. Yeah. So what are you guys waiting for? By coming to GTB once a year. Oh, I have the certificate too. Now it's time to go and... To, and the schools, the schools will take you. That's my grouse. They shouldn't take you. The parents shouldn't take you. If you say you are coming from Patrick's speech, I know GBK, everybody uses Patrick's speech. Ask her, oh, I've been to Patrick, so it's a lie. She will call me, Mrs. Akonde. I say, I've never heard that name before. <laughs> so you need to, it's, you see, it's not for me. It's not for any one of these people here. It's for you. Nobody can take it away from you. When you are strong, when you are big, you are what? You are big. You are big. <laughs> Nobody can take it away from you. Thank you. That's just what I want to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Akande. I have a question here. How can I, as a special educator, assist a child with multi-disability, i.e. a child with autism, deafness, hyperactivity, and has low vision, especially, and so she wants to find out communication and language strategies. Wow, comorbidity. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Omolola answer that. Um, first and sure. foremost, um, if you're a special educator and you have that child, that means there's an IEP in place. I want to believe. That what? An IEP an is IEP. in place because there's no how you're treating all of those disability. I, I, I don't think we, yes. we can hear you. An IEP, Individualized Education Plan. Is that okay. the one you mentioned it? Sorry. Yeah. Is that the one you mentioned it? Have you heard of the word IEP before? Show me the rest of your hand. So I'm speaking to us. We understand what I'm saying. You might not. <laughs> okay. So you, uh, you need to understand. And the thing is, because let me start from what I know. So I've, just like um, Mr. Conde and Mr. Adewale were saying, people say they are special educators. And the ABCs of special education, they do not have an idea of. I will not take a child that has all of those disabilities without knowing what the IEP says, because for them to um, diagnose that, they would have put IEP, what assessment does is that it gives you where to work with. So they've assessed that child, he has IED, um, intellectual disability, he has 
um, hearing impairment, he has vision. They must choose, you have to pick, choose your battles. So the IEP will say to you, on Mondays, this child is going to have speech, um, have a sign language interpreter coming. What is the level of severity of the hearing impairment? What is the level of severity of the um, visual impairment? We don't have such information. Now that's one thing about training. You have to have enough information as to what you're doing with that child. Another thing that that's bringing also to is because this answer, I can't answer. But Lola, yes, because this person said he is the special educator. Special educator. So how come? The special educator prepares the IEP. So can What's we get plan? more insight into Morning that operation. question? Did that okay. child come with a doctor's report? Did yeah. that child come with a diagnosis? What is the background yeah. to... Thank you, Ma. We prepare IEP, yeah. okay. but the, and I'm a special educator in VI, visual impairment. But the major challenge is I want to teach how to write and read Braille. And because of the deafness, that's why I need the strategy Hold on. for the. Okay, let's take it one by one. The child, let's, let's identify the uh, special needs here. The That's first one. Hold on. Okay. Uh, the autism. The, the child has. Oh, autism. The child is living with autism. Yes. One. Uh, deafness. The child has hearing impairment. Yes. Two. Low vision. The child has visual impairment. Three. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. So we have comorbidity here. Yes, now, the functional skills, the child has function, any functional skill? Yes, uh, eh? yes ma. At, at least the child will eat if you give the child food. Yes, she okay. can do that. You see, let's be practical here. When you want to give that child food, okay, decide whether to use tactile, touch, to teach. So you have to decide what kind of touch you want to touch that child before you give the food. So start to peer a mean, choose a means of communication. Choose your battle. You can't put everything on the plate and you expect to succeed with a child having comorbidity. Then who gave you all the diagnosis? Who gave all the diagnosis or was it just observation or subjective? My observation. Oh. Ah! Oh, Luau. Ma, I've, been, wait, I've been asking for medical reports, but I've not been given. But my observation. Kole work! Kole work! Yes, so um, well, thank you. Thank we, you, Dr. We can Grace. go on. Well, yeah. Miss Adewale, yeah. continue. Okay, one house, please. You know, if there's anything you're taking away from here today, one main thing you should take away is that you always need a diagnosis to be able to implement the appropriate intervention, period. You need the diagnosis because that would help you, will guide you into what sort of intervention to give. But don't make your own assumptions. Saying the child has autism, the child may not have autism. So you never really know what it is, but um, we are not. Okay. We have don't throw so yourself to a herbalist. But <laughs> or to babalawo. Yes, but what it really yes. basically is is with comorbidity, you don't use one approach. There's ah. no one size fits all. Yeah. So um, you will have to choose your battles, indeed. I have All right. So many question. questions with yeah. me, Mrs. Adowale, and honestly, I feel like I can personally respond to some of these questions. Because I'm seeing questions like, what are the causes of autism? And I know we've done this yesterday. So we're going to ignore questions like that and go into... No, no, don't let us ignore. No, it no. might be the, no, that no, first we'll person's day, first time. day we'll two. Ignore. This we'll is day the, two. It might be the first person's first time. Okay. All right. What are the causes of autism? You answer it. Okay. Oh, Lola? Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I'll, so um, autism, most of the time, because of our, the kind of... Con our, Cultural belief, we always attribute it to spirituality or some form of um, enigma or, or um, witchcrafty and all of that. But it's not true. It's not true. Research has not shown. And when you talk about special education, it must be evidence-based. It must be research-based. Now, research has not been able to pinpoint exactly what it is. Some are saying it's external factors. Some are saying it's uh, toxin. Some are saying that the brain of a child with autism is different from the brain with, of a child without autism. 
Um, several speculations, but nothing that they would hold water per se to say this is the cause of autism. Some people are saying it's age, age related and all of that, but we've seen people that are 60 or 70 and they've had kids who do not have autism. Summary. So, there is no known one cause. There is no known one cause. Yes. It's, the only thing that is close is that it has a genetic, genetic. connection. Yes. And then some environmental factors which have not been established. Yes. So if you have only met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. Thank you. Next question. I have a question. How important is the parent in regards to what you do? How? How important is the parent participation and collaboration in what you do? For us at the TLP Center, parent involvement is extremely key. It's very necessary. Tell us why. Yes, it's very necessary because there has to be continuity at home. There is no way the child, you, you don't prepare the child for separate behaviors at home and at school. So everybody has to be involved, not just parents, it's a triangle. So there's the parents on one side, there's the school, and then there's the child. All three have to connect in order for you to get a wholesome result. Otherwise, you're working, your, your work is an exercise in futility. Parents need to know what you're doing. They need to know what you're doing each week. There's a weekly report that goes out to them. And they're expected to write back to us, telling us what the child also did, what they have seen. That's the only way you can have a follow-up. Otherwise, you're all just doing because at home they may be do, doing something different. And research has proven that when you teach them, you're all teaching the same way. They like that. I mean, that's the way they learn easiest anyway. So that way you're able to get more information in. And we also talk about the way we pronounce things also. Some people say tomato, some people say tomatoes. It's very important that everyone is using the same language when you're teaching a person with autism. You're not trying to teach too many things. So it's very critical that parents are involved. And the way we get our parents involved is because we first noticed that our parents still would do it one time and not the other. We started insisting on parent-teachers conference. And for parent-teachers conference, if they don't come, at the end of the term, it is written in the child's report. It is unfortunate that parent-teachers conference was not attended on your behalf this term or this quarter. Parents don't like that because I guess those reports are sought sometimes when they're getting into other schools. They ask them to bring the report and they see that parents were not going for. So with that, I think that, that's just, just that phrase and that's why I'm sharing it. You can use it as well. It did magic. Right now, they keep on calling. I'm coming next week. I'm coming. Can I, make a, can I change my appointment? But it's very important that parents are involved and carried along. Thank you. Oh, can, please, can I add something quickly to that? I have met parents and I've heard of parents whose children are going through therapy and they have no clue what's happening. They do not have an IEP of the child. They get reports and they don't read it. Mm -hmm. that's, for me, that's even the start of parents' involvement. IEP is not planned solely by the educator or by the therapist or by the school. Is planned in collaboration with the parents. parents. So if you do not attend the, um, the IEP meeting, then the school will decide what they want to achieve in your child. Meanwhile, you have what you are looking for. So at the end of the term, you come back and say, they wasted my money. But they did not waste your money. You wasted your money yourself. So it's important that you, um, per, you if your child, you're taking your child into a school, I think I said, said yesterday, if you're, you're taking your child into a school, be it a mainstream school or a special needs school. You don't ask questions. What services are they rendering? What are the accommodations that are, made for, that are going to be made for your child? You know your child first, so you, will tell, you can tell them what the needs, the accommodations you even want for your child. When, you, when they see that commitment, um, you will put them on their toes because they want, to, they, know, they want to see results because they know that you are involved. So the school will, be, the school will work of course, school will always work, but the idea is it would push for more effectiveness. And therapy or facilitation or teaching is more effective when it's being continued at home. You find that attention is paid more to the child of the parent who always shouts. That's my conclusion to that. Okay, yeah. so um, I have a question. Um, I was going to ask, based on what we had said earlier, is it possible, maybe Ms. Bolande or the Diola, to have like, or maybe we already have it and we don't know about it, to have one site, maybe on Instagram or, you know, a website where 
all the different um, trainings that come up can be put on there. Because we've done trainings, Jella knows, and Auntie Grace knows, we do trainings as well. So just maybe have a site where everyone can go on because people come here for help. People don't really know where to go. So saying, or oh, just go online, it's very, very vague and very blah. It doesn't really help. That's one thing. And then another thing is, you know, I just said now, parents are here because they're looking for help. Um, there are lots of um, special education centers, you know, learning centers and things like that that churn out these people that are called therapists and facilitators. They churn them out and these people are le unleashed into the society. Parents are, to be honest, they're desperate. And they don't know any better. So is there a possibility now that, because for me, I, do, I don't want us to just do another GTB Autism Awareness, we can be gone with it. Can we get something where all you educators and specialists in the room sit down and say, listen, there's a way we need to um, standardize this, and you have to have this certification. Recently in Nigeria, the fitness industry did it. So they got IREP to say, all of you get certification from IREPs before you decide that you're a personal trainer. Isn't there something you guys sitting there can do to help these mummies and daddies sitting here to save them from Ex wasting money and throwing money at these people who come to their homes and tell them? Yesterday, a lady came to me and told me about a facilitator who came to the house and was doing rubbish with her child. But she goes to work. She's trying to make money to pay the facilitator. You guys know this thing costs an arm and a leg. So she has to go to work. And on this day of our Lord, she was at home and she saw the nonsense that was going on. I've been to a school. I just came to see my, my daughter and I saw the facilitator having a chat with another person while the, ch the child she was supposed to be doing one on one time with was running amok. Auntie Grace was there that day. We were, we were living. Yeah, we there. almost lunged at the guy like, what are you doing? The mother is paying per hour and you're here having a chat. So isn't there a way you guys in this room can save parents, please? Definitely. I think that is um, an awesome request because indeed, well, what it sounds like, first of all, as she was talking, I was thinking, this is the job of the government, this is the job of the government, this is the job of the government. But where the government doesn't do it, do we all just sit down and look? No. Yes, so we forget the government and we look. But yes, to answer your question, there is one very big autism awareness um, site online, and it's, a, it's Nigerian bread. It's actually Autism Parents Association International. API. API has, a, well, it was first PI, which was um, Parents Against Autism Initiative, and they changed the name, and in the past two years, they have reawakened, and I see a lot of um, activities online, and they also have information. I think there's a WhatsApp group as well. The two ladies from there came in today that are actively pushing. So for autism, you can actually go there, and you get a lot of information. Parents um, sign in, parents re make requests, what I saw recently there was all summer camp programs that are going on for children with autism. Different centers, they were all listed on the um, API page. So you can check API. But that said, API is just one, and API may not be the only one, but at the same time, it would be nice to streamline. So that's something really, really um, worthy of consideration so that we consolidate, and there is one body that governs, one body that monitors. And I know that Patrick is also trying a lot, and we also try a lot as well. But we would all consolidate. The, one of the fallouts of this event this year will be us consolidating and coming up with something so that next year we will be able to boastfully tell you that, yes, we can now stream. Like, if they're not this, then you shouldn't use them or you shouldn't do that. We'll get ourselves registered with the government and just do a follow-up. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, um, so I want to add on, sorry, on okay. Facebook... There is the Nigerians, Nigerians for Autism, Autism Facebook group where people that, want to, that are running trainings will always post there. I am aware of teaching, because I work in mainstream, uh, in mainstream school setting, there's a teacher's network group on Facebook as well, where pe and there's an educational training something. But if you search for teacher's network, I search for educa educational trainings. So people post trainings for teachers there, and in fact, in teachers' network, people that are special needs teachers, for example, drop tips for classroom teachers to say, do you have a child with special needs in your class? These are tips specific for specific needs. So, that, so teachers' network, Nigerians for Autism, and educational training in Nigeria or something. Okay, on so, Facebook. so there are things, um, to, but, but like I said, it would be nice to streamline and know that um, 
these are the world because there's so many. There are actually, I, I know of many of them. And some of them you go to the same way I said online jargon initially, but then you also have some very good ones. So it would be nice to streamline and know which ones are. But yes, I know Nigerians for Autism as well. And Nigerians for Autism is also a very reliable um, site. Anybody else? Yes, I think Anna had something. Yeah, I do have something to say. See, first of all, uh, in a lot of uh, other schools and other places, there's no way an outside uh, therapist should even be allowed in the classroom, number one. Number two, if all schools were to uh, initiate an inclusive program, even if it's not uh, a school for people with special needs, but there should be an approved list at a particular school of people that they know work you should not come out, uh, come from the outside and say, well, I have a therapist that's been working with my child. Let him come into school and work with the kid. That, that should not go on. Mm -hmm. I know this is a different place. And now that we know what we know uh, about therapy and, and being consistent, that we should consider looking at how to monitor who comes into what classroom. Because just because I like you doesn't mean I want you, you should be in the classroom. And you're not just affecting my child. You'll see other kids, and not everybody is trained sufficiently to do this kind of work. Thank you very much. Well, that is our policy. That's a very big policy of ours. We do not take external facilitators at the learning place. They have to be facilitators that come through the, the system. And the reason we do this is not because we're snooty or because we're trying to turn them. It's because we need, first and foremost, we need uniformity. We need to know that we're all on the same page. External facilitators that we've had in the past seem to be at a different place from us, and we found that it was even hard to keep up with them. It was hard for them to keep our rules as a school. They started to interfere with other children in the classroom, they, just losing their place, and we thought, no, this isn't working. So we don't take external facilitators, and really, because also with the internal facilitators, you know exactly what they're doing. So they're in, working in line with the curriculum. At home, it's also promoted, so it's that way. And so I agree with you that external facilitators don't um, they don't help within, at least within our own school, we don't, we don't use them. But I know that a lot of schools in Nigeria use um, the external facilitators. I guess it's working for them. But we at the learning place don't use external facilitators. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. Question here. We have a question here. Yes. Yeah. My name is uh, Adenike Akindele. Somebody. My name is Adenike Akindele. I'm a parent. I'm not a teacher. But I'm here all the way from Ibadan to ask a beautiful question. I'm a mother of an autistic child. She's 18 years old child. Now, she cannot go to school because I cannot afford the payment. How do I keep her? How do I fight future for her? Because there will be a day I will close these eyes and I will not open it again. Who will take care of her? Who will accept her as an autistic child? There's no way for her. That's why I'm here to ask this question. Where should you go from here? If I am no more, who will take care of her? She's 18 years old. She cannot do anything for herself or fight for herself. What my question is, I am poor. I cannot afford any therapy or any spiritual therapy for her. What do I do as a parent? This is my question for mothers and caregivers. Um, this is um, partially addressing that question. Okay. Oh, thank you. God bless you, mother. You are not going to die. Amen. You are going to live to hear the fruits of your labor. Amen. That child is not helpless. That child, it, uh, that child is, not, uh, is not at zero level. Go back home, ma, and try to explore your child. There's one innate ability in her that you are yet to discover. Please, ma, go back home and explore. She is not empty. Hold on, hold on, let me make my point. She is not empty. You are not practical. I met, hold on, let me make my point. 
I met a lady uh, with an, with, uh, with uh, autism at 21. At 21, with comorbidities, with cerebral palsy. She just has one hand with cerebral palsy at 21. I met her a year ago. Today, Dayo is a bidder. Today, Dayo is a bidder. Dayo presents her bits in my clinic. We buy all the time. Yes, you have to look. Yes, hold on. Yes. That's the way. Find what she find her strength and build it. Find everybody angry. Hello, ma. Please let's calm down. Let's calm down. Let us calm down. Please, can we calm down? Please, please, let's calm down. Let us calm down. Please. 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 That is a cry for help. That is a cry for help. And everybody that is clapping or everybody that is murmuring, it falls on our plate. It's not only for those on this side or this side. It falls on all our place. Mommy Ebun, bring Ebun to the consultant. I know her. I yeah. told her. Bring Ebun to the consultation. Thank you so much, Mrs. Akonde. Thank you so much, Patrick's speech. Hey. Um... Thank you, Mrs. Akonde. As a mother, I think the very first thing you want is an answer. She has gotten an answer, but it doesn't only fall with Mrs. Akonde. How many of us are willing to support that cause? To support Mommy Ebu? I'm a mother. If you are willing, we would make, no matter how small, we'll make a donation to this cause. You are helping community. It is awareness. It is acceptance. This is what we are here for. So if we only say, oh, well done, Mrs. Akonde, what is your part to play? Let us play that part. Yeah. I would support. Please let the account number go up and let us start making transfers to this 18-year-old course. Thank you. But, Mr. Dewey. Mr. Dewey. Sorry, one second, please. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. My name is Denise Hetherington. I'm a speech pathologist. Okay. And I've Thank come you. here from the United States, I'm invited by Dr. Anna Lama Kamara through Blazing Trails. And myself and all the therapists that have come here, we've come here to help you. We don't get paid for doing this. But GT Bank makes it possible for us to come here. And I've spoken to Ms. Akandai um, and some of the parents, because many of the parents that I have met have said to me, I can't afford speech therapy. I pay $500 a month, and, and, and then I can only pay it for so many months. And one of the things that we do in the States is we provide group therapy. Now, you have to have a certain amount of training to handle the number of children that we handle, because I, I see over 60 children a week. That's on my caseload. So I had spoken to Ms. Kondai about this and about some of the therapists, instead of being one person in the classroom with one individual, but one person seeing five children a week. And that way, you can save some money. You still make the same amount of money, but the parents don't have to pay so much. So there's some different ways and different ideas that we have that we're here to help. 
You know, I appreciate and I respect the fact that you have taken the helm and what you're doing here and how resourceful the people are here of Nigeria, you know, and we're here to help you. But the way the services are being provided are not as efficient as they could be. So if that's something that you all could work on, okay. you know, with Ms. Condi, yes. and then like I said, we're willing to do whatever we Thank can. Thank you. To help. Thank you very much for that. Sorry, we have a lady here who has some details. I just want to take it before we go on to the next question. Um, this information, actually, I think it is long overdue. Many people do not know that there is actually a National Resource Center for the Disabled situated here in the Southwest, the only one of its kind in the nation. It's only in Oyo, Federal College of Education Special in Oyo. It was a um, TED fund that set up this uh, center way back in 2002. And uh, the TED fund funded it for a year and then dropped it. And the college, because they could not afford to use funds for academic programs to run it, it seems to be life, but it had just been resuscitated two years ago. And we have been running programs for people like um, uh, this uh, uh, Bun lady. It's, it's 18 years, it's not too late. I know even at the Federal College of Education Special Lawyer, a few years back, somebody brought a, a man of 34 years old. He just heard about uh, our college all the way from Benin. And we were able to do assessments. We do assessments and then we, well, educational assessment anyway, and then we do orientation. You know, apart from educational placement, we do orientation. We have even had children pulled out from school, and then we do orientation for them, and then we send them back to school. And I think 18 years is not too late. Are you residential? Please. Yes, we have residential only for somebody who is a little grown, like her, yes. Okay. I we, guess we you can leave your details have, so that we will we'll follow up. Once we're at yes. it's good to know the information you've shared now is that you exist. Yes. So it's nice to know that you exist. I guess to, to be able to follow up, because it's not a discussion for now, but we would note who you are and put, give the details to GT Bank and we will take it from there and know that you exist so people can start to um, utilize your services more. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Uh, are you ready? To yeah. No, not a question. Just to add to what Ms. Zakonde said. I think we got a little bit emotional when Mama spoke, but we didn't allow her to get the message. Ms. Zakonde said that she should bring her daughter for consultation tomorrow. So, but we didn't let her hear that. Mama Ebu, Mommy Ebu yes. is, is Ebu in Lagos. She's in Lagos. Can you get her to Patrick to for the consultation? There's a consultation going on in Ikeja tomorrow. GT Bank cons consultation. Uh, digital Village. It's Alausa. Digital Village, Alausa, behind Old Secretary. So can you please come to the consultation and we will take it from there. And whatever help can be rendered would also be discussed further at the consultation tomorrow. Okay, whatever and referral will be made, okay, will be I, I will communicated. Okay. All right, ma'am. I'll surely bring her there. Thank you very Thank much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Next question, please. Okay, so yeah. we have just a little over 10 minutes. Okay. Hello. The question goes... One mic, please. Sorry, sir, I'm just going to take a step. What yeah. precautions can be taken medically to avoid giving birth to autistic children? Ah. This is too Well, much. first and foremost, that person has not been here. Autistic children... Uh, let's take that away now, if nothing else, with children with autism. But um, unfortunately, there is no medication known that will prevent anybody in any part of the world from having a child with autism. I'm sure if that medication existed, we would all have gone for it by now. Mrs. So um, there's Mrs. a medication. Mr. there is a medicine. If you don't yeah. want to have a child with autism, then you don't have children. <laughs> yes. Don't hello, have children. Hello. She has something. She wants to say something. 
Yeah. Hello. Yes, someone has a question at the back. We'll come back. <laughs> yeah, a few minutes ago, Dr. Nimat. Dr. Nimat gave an example of how we can engage our community. She cited an example of educating religious leaders, among other things. I want to make it practical by saying that in my environment, I have a street whereby I have a mosque and a church which can represent a religious body. We have a counselor that represents government, among other people we are meant to consider. What about a situation whereby we don't have an ideal society for us to still be accepted? Despite the fact that we want to educate them to be accepted, we have looked into all the agencies, but we are not still accepted. How can we manage such situation? Number one. Number two is that it's eight years that um, GTB has been doing this, and I've learned more than five years I've been attending for the past five years. So I want to say a very big thank you to GT. But my question is, I don't want to be misunderstood. Should I come here next year again to still come and learn about autism? As an early childhood practitioner, I understand other developmental challenges children could have. We have Down syndrome, we have trisome 21, among other things. Can we look wider beyond autism, even though we are meant to continue this? Thank you. Okay, for the GT Bank, I would let a GT Bank representative answer that. But your first question is, how can you be recognized? We'll come back to that. How can you be, what, so I want to understand that. You're saying, how can you be recognized as an institution? Was that the question? No. How, as a religious body. I'm, to, I'm actually totally talking awareness. about acceptance in society. Yes. I said, Dr. Nimat said we should engage our community. Yes, but that. we can have a, a, an environment that is not ideal for us. Just, just give the question only now, sir. Only Pardon? the question. Just let us have your question. My question is, we are asked to engage our community. In the community, there are some factors to be considered. Among the few mentioned, we said our religious leaders, because people go to That them. is not a question, sir. Can you please no, ask I'm, a question? I, would you just allow we, me we to We heard please? that part at the beginning. Just give the question only now. We're running out of time. I asked the question, you did not get it. No, so I, I heard the first part. I just didn't get the last Sorry, one. sir. We hardly hear you. Can you try again? I can sue you for disturbing me. <laughs> Basically, I'm asking that when we have an environment that is not ideal for acceptance, uh -huh. How do we go about the challenge? Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. So you say an environment that is not ideal for acceptance. Yes. Like, well, the reason for this awareness program, for people to become informed about accepting individuals living with autism, that they don't, it's not by demons. They didn't become, uh, they didn't develop the symptoms of autism because they have done something wrong or because they ate something they are not supposed to eat or because there was one wizard that uh, uh, held the child at birth or where the parents went to. That's the essence of this awareness program. You have been coming here for the past five years, sir. Have you taken any information here to your church and also inform people that the essence of this program is not just for you alone. When you come here today and you are in an environment where you think they are yet to accept the idea that kids with autism exist or they don't understand what autism is, can you take the information you've learned here and start an awareness program Wherever you are, the advocacy starts with you. Yes. And, and in addition Just to, to that, reiterate. you can get more support from these other organizations that we say exist online. You can write to them, let them know that this is what you want to do. And whatever resources can be added to what you need to be able to make the awareness a possibility will be sent to you. So just to reiterate scale. what has been said, yeah. sir, to answer your question, um, and I'm going to pick my words. The onus is on us as the community to push the word out, to spread the word. We have given you eight, eight different uh, autism awareness uh, conferences. That's GT Bank, that is. Now, we're an advocacy 
It's an advocacy initiative. What does that mean? Is that we're advocating for children and adults living with autism. There are a billion problems that currently exist in the world, but we cannot fix it all. We have focused on autism, and we'll continue to focus on, on autism until the word has been spread out, until you go out, you push, and you spread it to your families, to your church, and to your community. Thank you very much. Yes. She have one. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I've been raising my hand since we talked about preventing uh, mothers, preventing uh, giving birth to children living with autism. Um, it seems far-fetched, but what about us that had our first child and the child is living with autism? You should just stick there. Anyways, research has shown that if you do a proper prenatal supplementation, nutrient supplementation, detoxification, and reducing the amount of toxins you come in contact with. I mean, prepare your body very well before you receive a fetus in you. It goes a very long way to minimize the chances of getting children living with autism. No, uh, well, okay. It, I will it, it does, the, the question was, how do you prevent it? There's no way to present it. There's that is no, the answer to there's that. There's no point. There is blank no way, way to, to prevent yes. it. Okay. But there are things you could do. Yes. Let me come in. And Hold then. on. Please wait. Yes. You know, we have parents here. Please, let's inform yes. them properly. Okay. Now, next remember, folic acid. Hello, mothers here. You know, folic, folic acid, isn't it? And doctors, pregnant women, folic acid is like what? Like a savior. Reason being that they are trying to reduce the chance of having a child with spinal bifida. Spinal bifida is a condition that can affect the spine thereby making it impossible for the child to develop motor skills and some other developmental conditions like cleft palate, you know, where a child is, at, is uh, during embryo, embryonic stage, that is during conception. After conception, the child starts to grow. You know, X and Y hormones, it's very important, please. X and Y hormones, I'm sorry, chromosomes are inherited one from the parent, one from, from, one from the father, and one from the mother, okay? And when they are coming together, they are forming like this, such that your left hand and your right hand are, not, are never the same. You find out that you Doctor, have like this line, okay? So folic acid is just to minimize the chance mm -hmm. yeah. of having some of those deficits that could happen during the embryonic stage. So what she's trying to say is that you can prepare your body for conception and also do some things deliberately to minimize the chance. It doesn't mean that you can prevent having a child with autism, in like a I nutshell, said. In a nutshell, even after you have minimized, you can still have a child yes. with autism. That is the reality of it's the It's a reality. Yes. So I think on this note, um, I will go back there to end it. Thank you all so much for um, being a very wonderful audience. Once again, I'd like to thank my team, um, Ajibi Care, Dr. Grace, Omolola, Adelola, and Beauty. Have we done justice this afternoon? Thank you all so much for being here. And get ready for the next session. It's also going to be equally interesting. Thank you so much.
Are we having a good time so far? At this rate, I'm thinking we might need to extend this conference to another day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I bring a young, charming boy on stage. As you've heard, was it Camille? Camille said, how do you describe your child? Now, he's not my child, but he's a special child. He's gifted and he's courageous and he has a wonderful smile. Ziza Okugo is a nine-year-old boy who attends a mainstream school. Now, we have just gone through inclusion in mainstream schools. Ziza is actually in a mainstream school. He has special talents, special gifts, special skills. He paints, he plays an instrument, and he does so many other things, in addition to bringing a lot of joy to his parents and to his family at large. I'm going to be taking you through a few of his pictures um, on the screen, so you'll see that. But please put your hands together for Ziza Okugo as he comes on stage. Ziza is just another example of what children living with autism can do. Okay. Cesar is going to be with us in about two minutes. He has, they've just gone to get him. In the meantime, though, let me take you through the next panel discussion. It's a community discussion, and the topic is social inclusion of people with developmental disability, a community engagement model. It's going to be moderated by Dr. Adiola Fayemi. She would, ha she would come on stage and present her team I'll just go through a brief bio of all of them, including Dr. Adiola Faemi. Dr. Adiola Faemi is the new manager of diversity and inclusion for the Office of Inclusion and Diversity. She is responsible for ensuring the effective implementation of the university's diversity strategic plan as a business imperative. Previously, the Director of Student Services and the Director of the K2 Equity and Access at Florida Department of Education, she has over 30 years of professional experience in teaching, administering, support services, and leading diversity and inclusion management in universities and state governments. Joining her discussion is Denise Hetherington. Denise, did I get that right? Heather Rinton. Dennis is a speech therapist. Dennis is a speech therapist at the Chicago Public Schools. Dennis has had the privilege of working as a speech pathologist for the Chicago Public Schools. She has serviced students in grades preschool through 12 diagnosed with 12 diagnosed with speech as the primary disability and speech as related service. She received her bachelor's degree in communications at the University of Illinois, Chicago in 1978 and a master's degree in speech pathology from the University of Iowa in 1981. Before I go on, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Ziza Okubo.
Thank you very much, Ziza. Remember, Ziza is nine years old. He's also a painter. You can see some of his work on the screen. He's nine years old. <laughs> Kindly follow him on Instagram just to be inspired by his work. His Instagram handle is as reflected on the screen. Just to remind everyone, that we have exhibitors outside at Ajip entrance. Please feel free to go down there, purchase a few items, resources, puzzles, the talking pen, and other educational materials that you will need for your children. Now, going right into our next session, one of our panelists, the other of our panelists is Dr. Campbell Elizabeth Adebola. She is a consultant psychiatrist with the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. She serves as a child and adolescent psychiatrist with certification in child and adolescent psychiatrics. Elizabeth has been involved in the Orange Ribbon Initiative since 2013, coordinating the activities at the one-on-one -on -one consultation. She is a member of the Neurodevelopmental and Autism Resource Center of the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. The next panelist is Dr. Oladikbo Adeolu Shoumi. He's a qualified medical doctor from Olabisi Onobanjo University. He proceeded to the University College Hospital of Ibadan for his medical internship in 2007. Bimbo Akinyelure is an occupational therapist at the National Orthopo Orthopedic Hospital of Lagos. She will be joining us as a panelist as well. The last but not the least is Mrs. Doinsola Adebomehi. She's a behavior analyst and she will be joining us on the panel as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for them as they come to discuss social inclusion of people with developmental disability, a community engagement model. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. After that heated discussion, spirited, passionate discussion, I am convinced that we are all a community working towards one goal. Uh, if we have that much passion about anything in particular, um, and we want to see improvements made, then we are a community. Um, my name is Adiola Fayemi, and um, the topic is social inclusion of persons with intellectual development disabilities. Actually, the last panel was going into it already because we're talking about what can we do with all this energy, with all these resources, with all what we've heard here, and with all the assets as well as all the challenges, what can we do to move forward? Let me start with a story. Um, I've lived in the U.S. for 30 years now, but I come, I've, I've been here every single year for the last eight years for this um, um, autism seminar. Um, my mother, God rest her soul, came to visit me, visit me um, sometime, and we were in Baltimore, and Baltimore, Maryland. In the she was in her, in her traditional attire, Bubani Row, and. Um, we were, as we were going through the mall, but Baltimore is a place where there are so many Nigerians in the diaspora and their children. As we were going through the mall, little um, young, people who are young and old, even though they were in their jeans and jackets and everything, 
seeing my mom, older lady, with her bubani room. I will, what we will be surprised that they are even Nigerians. And my mother would say, Ah, Eka Leo, Mommy in call, Daddy in call, Shelewa, Dada. I would ask her, Hey, Mawarini, do you know her? She said, No, I'm a wani. You know? That's how we are. We have that very, if we don't have anything, we have a sense of community. So, um, how do we tap into that sense of community? How do we. Encourage us to move forward. That is what this discussion is about. And uh, so many things, I, I had so many things. I'm so happy that I'm, I was here uh, because last year my presentation was how can we move forward? How can we use what we have to move forward? Um, I have my panel of experts here today and I'm looking forward to the very spirited discussions as well, I'm sure. Um, let me run through the, a presentation very quickly. Disability in Nigeria, we have heard yesterday, and I tried to find if anybody had any recent information about what, how many people are disabled in Nigeria. How many people have autism in Nigeria? Nobody can really say yes, because somebody will talk this morning about the importance of data. We don't know. But that is one of the important that's going to move us forward. We have the World Health Organization saying something. We have the uh, UNESCO saying another thing about the number of Nigerians. One thing is certain, though, if you are not disabled now, guess what? If you live long enough, you will become disabled. And so we need that sense of community to be able to help us move forward and address disability issues. When we talk about social inclusion, I think it's very important that we know what it is. We've talked about inclusion in the classroom, but when we're talking about social inclusion, we're talking about each and every one of us. What do we do as a community? It's a process of improving the individuals and groups to take part fully in society. They are to improve the ability, opportunity, and dignity of those disadvantaged or disabled on the basis of their ability to take part fully in society. How does that happen? I'm just going to go on. Also, we have, um, during the uh, conference, we've talked about what is that? How do we see disability? There's the medical model. The medical model blames the impairment. Oh, that person has the impairment. They must be responsible. The other model talks about the social model where we all get together and establish structures in the society that help people with disabilities. So, that takes me to the model. Please forward the slides. Next, next. That's the one I want us to focus on. So we are responsible. Somebody said just now, it begins with us. So we have our responsibilities as individuals. We have responsibilities as how we relate to each other. We have responsibilities organizationally, including businesses. Somebody talked about that. We have it as a community, and we have the social political, which also includes government and legislation. Okay, over to my panel of experts. Um, we have some questions we would like to talk about. We'd like to um, bring to your attention. And I'm not going to call names. I want whoever is, feels motivated to answer first, to go ahead and answer. The first question is, how can we leverage our assets, our community assets and resources to foster a sense of social inclusion? in the community. Who wants to go first? Um, first thing is, uh, based on my experience, is forming parent groups. Parents, when you come together, and I talk to different people here who are, have, have formed some groups, but for those groups to come together, and create a network. And you're sharing information with each other, you're understanding what each other are going through, you know what's going on in the schools, you know what you want for your children. And so for parents to be able to come together and form parent groups, that's been a very powerful entity in the United States. 
and you can go as far as developing ways to fundraise. You know, funding is a big problem. And parents can come together and uh, start finding ways to raise money to address different officials and organizations in your communities, as well as finding out what does your school need in order to provide the services that need to be provided for your children. So for you parents to begin to come together, that is another way of not being out on the island by yourself, but that is another way of empowering yourselves as a group. Okay. Anybody else wants yeah, to contribute? May, Thank you, parents. If, uh, if, if I may add my voice to what she said. Um, her community, we still practice the traditional system, though it's facing out gradually, in which we have the home setting, we have um, maybe our kinsmen within the community, and then we have maybe the church, the mosque, and then some other set of people who would offer support. But the very first thing we need to do, or we need to know, is that the stigma is still very high. So we need to first desensitize it by one of the things we're doing advocacy, and then the parents need some respite. That's one of the things that burn people out. You know, day in, day out, day in, day out, you see the same mother being the one who goes to work, who takes care of the children. Over time, many of them have to lose their jobs. And then the finances is reduced. They, they get burnt out for taking care of the children. But we can leverage on what we have. If um, the family members are aware that this is not something contagious, the child, though, might be a bit disturbed, but if you give him a space to play within, he will probably will be able to curtail himself. And the mother can have time to go off to work. The father can have time to go off to work or someone is there assisting. And then as a whole, they will offer some level of support even for this parent. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, thank you me. for addressing the issue of stigma because a lot of the stigma is due to a lack of awareness and a lack of education. And... Um, the speaker this morning, uh, I believe it was Dr. Uh, Balogun, talked a lot about areas, different areas that we can use and assets that we have that we can use to educate. I was surprised at many of the things she talked about. Um, regarding the issue of uh, stigma, would you have any comments about how we can address that? I think um, about the issue of um, stigma. Stigma in the community. In the community. It is very, very rampant. Most people, most people in the community uh, this, they have this stigma for a child that has disability. Um, they don't really want to associate with them, basically. Even in the school sector, even they don't even want to take them in the class you know, to follow that student. In the community itself, they don't really want to relate with them. Some people, if they have disability, they don't want to buy things from them. And you see a disabled person selling drinks, nobody cares to buy, nobody wants to buy. You know, so the awareness is a key that will light a lot of people. Yeah. And I think it's very important as well to always, like I said earlier, at one point at, or the other in our lives, whether we are disabled now, visible or not, if we live long enough, we will have some kind of disability. And so if everybody knows that it's very difficult, it becomes a little more difficult to stigmatize disability. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. <clears throat> I was going to add to what um, my colleague said earlier. Um, I think really one of the things that we usually overlook in our environment, yes, we talk about stigmatization and all of that, but one of the things that I have found that we battle with the most is actually acceptance. Because several times you have a child who has several flags and the parents just refuse to accept it. And so most of the time, if you have lots of parents like that, it doesn't really matter what structure you put out there. It's going to be very difficult to reach the people who need it. So we, we're going to have to take that into consideration as well. Then regarding um, the stigmatization, I think one way we can leverage that is to... I work as well in a school. And um, one of the things that we have done in my environment is that we have demystified special needs. In our environment, we help everybody see that everybody has their strengths and everybody has their weaknesses. What I am really strong at, might, I might not be able to do what you are strong at, and you're not even very strong at that. So we 
help people understand that everybody has their strengths and then we work with that. So if we're able to achieve that with children and we are able to achieve it, we need to actually come out and help people begin to be aware of themselves. The, because these are the people we're coming to ask to accept people who appear to have certain challenges. It's not going to be so easy if they have not seen that they're also beautiful, they have something to share, they have a strength, you know, and all of that. So we really need to go back because these are the people that we're trying to work with. These are the people we're trying to sell what we have to. They're the people who will make our jobs a little bit easier and more achievable at the end of the day. So there's a need for us to be holistic about it and go beyond the families and the educators of people working with with right. autism or other so special it, needs. From what you're saying, it sounds as if it may be very helpful to have a public awareness campaign. I mean, apart from just the periodical process that we have, if we can all decide one way or the other to have a public awareness campaign using all the um, resources that we have, including um, people like, I, I, I was telling um, Dr. Balogu earlier today that I was, uh, about 10 years ago, I, was, I went to visit my parents in Elisha, right? And I was, in, on the, on, I was on the balcony around 7 p.m. when a town crier came, talking about a meeting, you know, and letting them realize that there was going to be a town meeting at a particular place. I figured that if that is very rudimentary, very uh, 20th century, but it's working for them. So those, we could even use those kind of resources that we have, traditional, that we have in the community, to start spreading that awareness in areas so that they can, everybody has that sense of consciousness about what disability is and what autism is, for example, especially when in the rural areas where we don't have uh, the, the same uh, resources that we have here, that are very uh, lower resourced. Yes, you have a question. Okay, let, let me add a little to what has been um, said. In Nigeria, there are so many things wrong in Nigeria, and there are some things that ought to be in place that would um, facilitate everything that we've been talking about here since yesterday. Now, in Nigeria, we don't have any mental health policy. What we still have is that Lunacy Act that the colonials gave to us. That old, old Lunacy Act. And apart from that, the mental health bill is yet. Now, the, the person you see on the street, or the one that people predicted in uh, that day, is usually an end result of a neglected illness. Much like somebody can have stroke. If you have untreated hypertension, you might have stroke. So the same thing happens. So when we say mental, we mean mind. Now, your mental functioning is what makes you human. We are all mental beings. Because some people will say, are you mental? Meaning that, are you mad? Or do you have mental illness? So when we say mental, we refer to the mind. And your mind is, is inside the brain. Yes. And, then, and, and, and it's like when we say cardiac. Cardiac means heart. When we say osteo, it means bones. Right. So they are, they are just medical terms. So when, when we talk about mental health, we are talking about the capacity to do all the mental, all, all, all the mental functioning right. well. And that is what makes us function as humans. That is what distinguishes us between... I mean, from, from other living forms. Because if you don't have your mind, you are not different from an animal. So that's, people should be concerned true. about their mental health. So people should not run away from what makes us human. So you're it's talking about, about public awareness. Yes. Education. People must understand it's, it's because that term, that term to, to people seems pejorative. There's nothing wrong with saying mental. Mental means mind, just like cardiac means heart. Just like hepatic means liver. Right, and those are some of the things we'll be talking about when we are educating the public, right, in general. Y yes. You know? yes. Yes, that's the, the confusion, the misperceptions that, yes. that people have. That's that we the underlying problem that we have. Right. It's ignorance. Right, it is. And that's why we, like, we, we have talked about a, maybe a public awareness campaign. Yes. You know, and, um, but, but you said people advocate. I heard you say people are advocating on their own. Yes, there's no framework. For everything that, I mean, there's a manual for everything. Right. Some people are doing it right. Some people are not doing so it how right. So do how do we bring people together as a force, strength in numbers, as a community, yes. to, to address this first thing we say is the priority, yes. public awareness. How do we do that? It's May about, I? I mean, like what GT is doing. GT is spending a lot of money. Now, if you want to bring people together, 
to teach them the right. You have to spend money. A lot of people don't have money. These big corporations, instead of them to, to sponsor things like this, they prefer to sponsor dancing and singing. So we should so encourage them. That, yes. We should encourage them, find a way yes, to encourage them. Yes, everything is not about dancing and singing. Right. That's why I, I really agree with you. And I also want to say that um, one of the things we've identified in our environment is that things are not working the way they should. Yes. And then it's not only um, with autism or yeah, special yeah. education and special needs yeah. that we have this, you know, red everything, flag showing everything. up. But a lot has happened. For instance, when we talk about industry, the same thing was happening. And everybody, you know, the people who were concerned, they got up and they did what they had to do. So now it's a case of autism. And it has to do with most of us in here. So we have to get up and do something. And I think that the panel that went before us actually laid the, a good um, carpet, so to speak, for us to walk on. We already agreed, I mean, we identified before that panel went off that there's a need for us to have, you know, uh, perhaps a consortium of sorts where we have the different people in the field, the educators, the parents, the um, extended families, the people themselves, you know, the clients and the people living with special needs, particularly autism, where we need to have everybody come together and from that place that we're all together, we're able to reach out and move on. Okay. So I'm hoping that with what hopefully started this afternoon, we should have a proper, uh, a good ground to start with from where we will now go ahead and build a framework and then plug in every other thing that needs to be done. Because I remember the very first autism, um, GT, Bank, GT Bank autism conference. Yeah. One of the things that went on and on and on was about how the government was not doing anything. I think the following year, someone from government came, a senator or something, and he said, oh, they were working on it, and they're still not doing it. So we need to start moving, and when they're ready to wake up, they plug into it, and then, then we will probably fly higher right. than we probably would have been moving right. by then. Sometimes but we, we need think to about move. the government will do it, but sometimes it's a grassroots effort, you know, that makes the change. I wanted us to move off to, to discuss a little bit about the heated discussion related to qualifications to address autism in the community. That was a very big thing, you know? Yes. To be able to move forward and say, okay, we're even addressing it, apart from the public awareness, to have people who are trained, you know, to help people in the community. How can we get to a point where we have some kind of standardization and know that, okay, this person is a therapist, which means this. What does this, this mean in the Nigerian community? Uh, we, we have a body that does that for therapy. There's a body called Medical Rehabilitation Therapy Board of Nigeria, and they're in charge of training physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, piano. So they give a license for every, uh, for every therapy. So every licensed therapy, all therapies are licensed. So it's left for the parent to ask, okay, if, can I see your license? for treating the child. So by that, you'll be able to like distinguish which one is root therapies or not. So that's but, it. But if I may um, lend my voice again. Yes. You know, in Nigeria, we celebrate a lot of things like certificates. There are many people who carry certificates who cannot do what the certificate says. But we've had an example that someone raised there. It starts with an interest first. Because when you see some of these parents, there is a lot of frustration. Year in, year out, they know what is wrong with their children, but they just don't have a means to be able to provide that care. Looking at autism as a case in study is a multidisciplinary thing. Nobody can say, I know it all. From the very first thing you need to do is, if you're catching it at an early age, yes, much can be done compared to if it is later in life. That person needs to be first assessed, and then you go into the community. But when you're talking about those who have certificates, a few of them are very expensive. But what we do in our centre, we have a form, uh, a forum in which parents come in, we meet once a month, and what we've encouraged them is that they should go and learn those skills themselves. There is a particular mother who has a child with Rett syndrome. We all know when we're looking at all the um, autistic spectrum, it's one of the worst prognostic um, cases. And she, when she went to this um, school in Oyo, she got some training, and now in our community, she's serving and working with people within the community, gathering them together, 
providing them with information. And it's become something now that everybody in the community sees her as somebody who knows. But at the end of the day, she's not honing it to herself too. She says, I want to link you up. And she's, I guess she should be here tomorrow at the consultation, even bringing a bus to bring people together. But what am I trying to achieve is that it's not only for you to get some form of knowledge, you should spread it around. And then let's develop on ourselves. What you know two, three years ago is not what is, in, what is currently holding in the nation. Like they said, you can learn online. You can go to achieve some training, but a little bit of emphasis on certificates is what I just want to, to draw attention to. It's good to have it to back us up that we have some level of training, but let the interest generate our uh, uh, moving forward to probably go for those trainings. Thank you. So there, is, so there would be self-directed learning yes. where a person would go and find out for themselves. But I'm talking about, and that's good, and there, but, but uh, usually in professions, when you're trying to really make sure that Definitely. you address an issue, you make sure that there are standards of practice, Definitely. right? One way I know of doing this is professional organizations okay. would write something, draft, yes. just start drafting something. This is yes. what you need to know to become a therapist yes. or yes. become a uh, speech or um, whatever you want it to be. But these are some of the things you need to know. If you start that, maybe eventually we will get you know, to a point where the government picks it up or somebody picks it up, That's association picks it up. What's been your experience, Dennis? Uh, my experience is that you know, everything that we're doing here is a process. And everything has to be taught in steps. As a speech pathologist, there's extensive training in articulation yes. disorders and development. There's extensive training in different types of language problems. There's uh, extensive training in voice disorders. There's extensive training in neuropathologies, just yes. dealing with autism. Yes you know, aphasia, cerebral palsy, uh, one specific area there, there's extensive training in disfluency. So trying to take one course and know all of this, it, 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 it doesn't happen that yes. way. So it may be better yes. if you focus on yes. one area. Yes. Maybe someone would specialize in articulation and someone would specialize in, um, you know, beginning anyway, begin to specialize in a different language disorders or stuttering. Right. So that, because when I mentioned earlier about the fact that we take on large caseloads, but in order to be able to take on large caseloads, when you do an assessment, you have to be able to see all of this. And you can't, because it's, if, if you haven't had extensive training in all of these different areas. Yes, that's it. So you get a child, and you know, I maybe talk to someone that's a therapist, working as a therapist, and they don't know all of the steps involved in teaching uh, articulation or how to teach it to someone that has apraxia. Yeah, They're going to miss that's steps. That's yes. And when you miss yes. steps, like yes. someone said earlier, you can cause problems. Yes. Then you have to go back and correct all the mistakes that that person made. And it's so can, important. I, can I add a little so, to that? Yes, I will. Just a second. It's so important that we give the children who, are, who need us the right training in what we're trying to achieve and who the, the users are, who we are actually trying to help. It all concerned about making sure that child is okay. And okay. one of the milestones, yes. the developmental process, and even yes. though different children do develop, some are faster, some are slower, some are that they follow. And so you have to know what is the child supposed to be doing in the there's first a, place. Because when, 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 when a baby is born in the beginning stages, then, then what they learn from their interactions with their parents is where they begin to grow. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, yes, to add a little to what has been said so far. You see, each specialization in in the medical field is You can't be just going to the university for three years. There are some basic things that you need. They are giving them certificates, and they 
in their profession. They all have guidelines They're up against. But now, the first thing. now, looking at the numbers of occupational therapies, I made mean a certified occupational therapist in Nigeria. We are not up to 30. Speech therapies, they are not up to 30. And look at the population we are managing. So, so it's a question of access to services. Services, exactly. So, and I, I'm not supporting Quakri. I'm not in support of it. But there should be a body. You can, they might be like, you can be occupational therapy aid. There should be something like that. And somebody should be supervising you. But not that you come for a two days program and say you are now an occupational therapist. The next thing now you are treating is you are managing a cerebral palsy case. You know, things like that. So I think there should be a body regulating this. I think that would be more better. And I like what you said about, you know, AIDS. You know, people who are maybe trainees, or, or you know, um, or, or helping, yes, supporting, yes, as yes, opposed to yes. pro, um, purporting themselves to be therapists when they actually don't even know the basics. You know, learn from the professionals. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think I think he said I couldn't understand everything that you said, but I, I think you you were saying what I was going to say because one of the things that we have done is those speech pathologists that have been trained properly certified as speech pathologists in order to service more children. Another model here is to have someone who has had some training, but not at the extensive training that the speech pathologist has had. And, and the speech pathologist would be the one to do the assessments and write that IEP IPS. that they were talking about. And then the person that is less trained will work under their supervision. Very good. I like, I like our discussion because it's talking about how in the end we address the most important people in the whole equation, the children and their needs. Let's go on to the, uh, this other question that I, uh, that's very interesting to me about we should, not, we should collaborate and not compete. Yes. Yeah. To build that sense of community, we need collaboration as Dr. Akonde, who was here, Ms. Akonde, who was here a few minutes ago, um, emphasized yesterday, to collaborate and not compete. How do we move in that direction? What, who, has, who wants to tackle that, that many uh, question? Many fields now is a competition, possibly because, you know, uh, because of the end game, which is financial. But the thing is, if we collaborate, one person can just do a little, with collaborative efforts, we can do much. And even with this collaboration, it's easier to fish out those who are not really who they say they are. So you think it's finance, but money, that is money, money, No, motivation. for competition, yeah. the target or the end result is because of what you're going to gain. But in collaboration, you'll be surprised that you even gain more yes. because you stand as a body. You become an, you know, a force that is difficult to shake. But when you are alone, you know, it's easier to bring one person down. But because of maybe ego, because of individual competitiveness, you know, we are all different persons and our personalities differ. But to be able to marshal a way forward, there is a need for a collective force. There is a need because one of the things I wanted to make mention of is even up to date, I've said it before here, I think two years ago when I made a presentation. For many diseases, we have a registry. There is a cancer registry. There is, uh, maybe when you're talking of hemophiliacs, you have an idea. But for autism, we really don't have an idea. The, all the researches we've been doing now, if it is community-based, is for those that come through advocacy like this, and then you have a high yield. But we don't even know to what extent this is. But it can only come through collaborative effort. And that is one thing we need at this stage. Enough of individualism. Enough of, I can do it all. Enough of, this is the best place to come. By the time we have an effort together, we'll move a step higher than what we've been doing. Thank you. Um, in addition to what she has said, um, the problem there is that uh, most parents, exactly, um, when they see a therapist, they want that occupational therapist to be the speech therapist, to be the behavioral therapist, to be everything. And when you try to explain to them that, see, this thing is about collaboration, you need to call in different professionals. They look about the money. But as a good therapist, as a good, as a good therapist, you need to stand your ground. This is not my job. It's a collaborative job. But most people will try to do that. They are the speech therapists. They are the behavior therapists. They are everything. They are all in one individual. 
Because yeah. nobody's Did enforcing you anything. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yes. 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 Before you go on, and I, it occurred to me as you were talking about the, the, you take the IEP, for example, the Individual Educational Plan, you see that when you have that plan and it's done properly, you have different professionals from different areas that come together to collaborate towards moving the child forward in terms of progress and things like that. That by itself shows how important it is to collaborate. So um, I just wanted to uh, Yeah, put that in. What, what has to happen when you're collaborating is everybody is to say, I'm the speech pathologist, and then you have an occupational therapist. Whatever somebody puts on the table that the child needs to do, each, uh, every, each person that's working in that area has to work on that skill. If I'm working with that child and he's got an occupational therapy goal or there's a sensory goal, like we uh, sometimes put a weighted vest on children with sensory problems, well, if I know that and I'm the speech pathologist and I see that the child is having some sensory problems during speech therapy, I would put that, that weighted vest on that child. Or if I have created a communication board for that child to use when they come to speech therapy, that child should be using that communication board in the classroom with the teacher, when he goes to occupational therapy, when he goes to lunch. So whatever is being put on the table is being put there for everybody's use. And I think that helps to keep people from saying, well, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be working right. on because the child is not split up into different pieces. This right. is one person, and these goals are all there to benefit that child. So if, if there are behavior therapy goals there, the teacher has to honor them, I have to honor them, the occupational therapist has to honor them, and the parents right. have to honor those goals. Right. So we have gone through a lot of, uh, uh, quite a lot since the discussion. We talked about the role of the parents, we talked about how to address stigma. Um, we suggested a public awareness campaign. And um, I took a lot of notes this morning when Dr. Balogun was talking about how we can have a public awareness campaign. She even talked about the, the role house helps can play, the role that the, the media, social media can play, churches, artisan communities. She talked about uh, youth leaders, uh, even traditional birth attendants. I think also about Nollywood, you know, Nollywood is something you, we people watch movies a lot. We could use some of the actors. I was very impressed when I saw uh, Bimbo, um, um, Akinto, is it Akintola, yesterday, you know, helping us with that. Those are the kind of people that people pay attention to, to spread that kind, those kind of campaigns. All kinds of things. We have, um, Blazing Trails have tried to, uh, done so, we've done some uh, um, public awareness in Pigeon, in the rural areas, for people to, just to customize it to get to where it should go. So that's about public awareness campaign. We talked about legislation and how we can get that going. We talked about standardization of the professions, how we can make sure that bodies are certified and use those who are supposed to be aides as aides and not as the professionals. We talked about the importance of education and the need for a collective force to, co to collaborate and not compete with each other, all for the good of the community. I think it's time to throw it, out, um, the, uh, it open to the audience now for questions. What kind of questions do you have or comments about how we can help move uh, our community, help the disabled in our community, particularly those with autism, to that sense of community, feeling that they can do the best they can? Sorry, while we're waiting for the questions, in the back. questions because I think Somebody the mic is going it. to go wrong. I also think that while we're waiting for all of those to happen, the, um, the standardization... You have, some, you, have some, you have some comments? Yes. Okay, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say that because the lives of the, the, the people we're talking about, the children and the adults living with autism, will not wait for us to get to that point, something came to me and I was wondering, since we're thinking of setting up a body where the different professionals and the, all the people affected by autism would be party to? Would it be in order to say we would have um, sessions, regular 
training exposures for parents where they get hands-on, um, yes. where they learn practically how to do the basic things. Yes. Because they're the basic things you have to do with the clients, and they're also the specialized ones. But people don't know that something as, um, you know, that ooh, uh, ooh, uh, all those exercises you do in speech, that who would be able, we're able to drop a proper curriculum can go in every other time. So you find that if I were to participate in that, I might not have to go more than twice in a year. But then all the parents will learn the basic things that they have to do. They be continue to work with them. Because one thing we have again now is that the professionals are there, the, uh, the children go to the professionals and then they get home and nothing else happens because they do not know how to do it. So there's actually a need now for us to come together and show them, let the people who know how to do it, show the people who have to do it, how to do it regularly without anybody losing. And I think that's a very good suggestion, empowering parents with the basic information that they need to be able to help their children. Um, having regular sessions for parents, I think it's wonderful. When, as you were talking to, I was thinking about, we, it's possible to have a helpline, you know, parents with autism help, helpline that they can call in an emergency and, you know, something's going on, they need help, nobody else is there, the therapists have gone home, the doctors are not around, you know, they can get the, the help they need by calling a hotline. That's another thing that could is be done with uh, not a whole lot of resources. That's another suggestion. Okay, questions. I saw some hands up. Yes, I have some questions here. Um, good afternoon, and I really appreciate what you said today. But please, what, what I want us to look at is this. From the Na National Bureau of um, Statistics, Nigerians' population grows by 5% on a yearly basis. In Europe, they achieved this in five years. The population of autistic or children with mental disabilities is increasing. How do we reduce the time you spend in the school? In the, in, 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 our, in the abroad, people spend three years doing an engineering course. In Nigeria, we spend five years. And upon all the five years, you're, not, you're still not qualified enough. So the question is this. How do we save people's time so they can get what they have to get on time and we can help these children and everybody moves on? Time is money, please. Thank you. What did he say? Oh, that one is a what that was one question. Is a, what is what is I don't understand what he's saying. Right Thank you very much. Is, how can we help the children? We couldn't really hear what he was saying. How can we help the children? How, how can we help the How could we help the children? By saving time. Sorry, sir. Take your question again. Make it direct and straight to the point. We, said, we, spent, we spent too much time in the school trying to help these children. How can we save our time? Learn the basics what we have to learn. Maybe like for like two months, three months course. Get the most important thing. Help these children on time and let everybody move on. That would want to. Can I say something, please? How can we help the children? Excuse me. Besides going to school? You're saying besides going to school? Yeah. No, I guess what you said, yes. we've already um, discussed it over here, that uh, some of all these people who present themselves as therapists is because they do not have intense training. But what he's saying is if you compare yourself as a Nigerian and someone who studies abroad, we might spend about five years here to study engineering over there maybe three years and then things go on that how can we shorten the time in training to be able to help these children on time i would say you cannot you know you cannot want to take a shortcut and want to achieve the same thing there are some laid down principles we said it here you can do it in phases what we said as an assistant there is a limit to what you can do yes. you go to the hospitals there are nurses there are nursing assistants if the work is too much for the nurses, the nurse's assistant can take maybe the BP and the pulse, and it ends there. So everybody needs to know their level in which they operate. So if you're one of those who want it shortened, that means you cannot do the full range of things. You still have to go back to study and then complete whatever you want to do. Right. But maybe it can be done in phases. That's the only answer I would like to. Right. And, then, and then in addition, in Nigeria, you know, we like shortcuts. You know, we should learn, we should start um, learning how to do the right thing 
in your own scope of influence or capacity, learn to be a positive influence. It's not only about the people in Abuja. A lot of us do the wrong thing, even in your practice. But the problem in Nigeria also is that as if you are a real professional, a real professional that is well-trained is not likely going to do the right thing. Like, I am a psychiatrist. I have enough work on my hand. I don't want to do the work of a pharmacist or a speech therapist or an occupational therapist. So, parents, if you get to someone who says, I am a behavioral therapist, I am a speech therapist, just run away. Because speech therapy is not easy. I have a friend who is a very good speech therapist. I see her when she walks. I can't do it. It takes all her energy. So if somebody says, I can do this, I can do this, I can do that, just know that that person is a quack. So, but parents want shortcuts. They want to receive everything in one spot. Yes, it's good, but in Nigeria, we don't yet have that facility. So sometimes you may need to go here for speech therapy and then go there for occupational therapy. It's unfortunate, but that is how it is for now. Right. And I don't think it's only Nigeria, actually, because when I was um, taking my applied behavior analysis training, we had to take it in modules. Sometimes I sat down and I thought, okay, at the end of the program, it was broken into, I think, three or four modules. I'm not, I can't really remember now. And by the time I was done, and evolve and learn and master whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing in their different fields before we come out. We all need to be patient. And, and yeah, we all need to be patient. And I realize what he's saying. I hope where he's coming from is out of the desire to help the children, right? If that is the premise, and you know you don't have the qualifications yet, learn from the professionals. Become an aid to a professional. Have internship programs. You know, those kind of things. So you can gradually build on the knowledge that you need to be able to help the children. You have a and every child that you work with is different. I don't care if it's an autistic individual, if they're hearing impaired, as a speech pathologist, every person that I meet is different. I don't care how old they are, if they're two years old or if they're 20. And so you have to have a basic understanding of some very serious issues around development, physical development, emotional development, psychological development, language development, linguistics, neuroprocessing, how the brain works. You have to get an understanding of those basics. Then you go into the different disorders. And it's just like when you're working with an autistic child. The example that you saw this morning of teaching a child how to use picture cues to get dressed in the morning. That takes time. It happened over, you know, in a matter of minutes or seconds here on stage, but that takes a lot of time. And it is not unusual for me to have a child on my caseload all the way from kindergarten or preschool until their 22nd year out of high school because they need those supports all along the way. It's a step-by-step -step process. You can't rush it. And it's when you don't understand what you're doing is when you're trying to rush it to get there. It's just like if you're trying to get a bottle open and it, something won't open, and what do you do? You start beating on it, you know, and because you're trying to push it because you don't understand. So this is a very tedious and slow and meticulous process, yes. and you can't rush it. Yes. All right, thank you very much. We have a question here. All right, thank you everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Uche and I'm a full-blown entrepreneur, but I have a zeal for humanity, actually for children. Um, I'm going to be 35 in October. I am not married. I don't have a baby, but I have a special interest in anything that concerns children. Um, currently, I'm a volunteer for Save a Child Mission. It's a, a new um, child care support program that just goes out you know, to just make children have a fabulous, um, you know, experience growing up, children who don't have any kind of parental support or anything, you know, in the charity homes and all that. So we just do more of field work and all that. Sometime last year, December, we had an event. It was like a Christmas party for children 
in the motherless homes. We went to different homes, and we just had a good time with them. You know, and so we, there was this child, he, he, was, he was three years old, I can remember him. He was very small, he had a lot of challenge with everything. He couldn't walk properly, he couldn't speak properly, he couldn't talk properly. You know, they, they kept calling him a special child. Um, I've really heard a lot about autism. I've never, had, I've never had the opportunity to come for a conference where I got a lot of information. I had all the information. I think I'll need to, you know, expose me to more awareness about autism about yesterday and today, and I've, I, I'm blown. I think at this moment, I'd really like to appreciate GT Bank for this initiative, because people like me now have an idea of what autism is, and I can, you know, participate. So I think they deserve a round of applause. I mean, GT Bank, you guys are doing well. So I have a couple of questions I want to ask. Yes, please, I have three, actually. Let's go straight to the question. Okay, one, but I, I think I, I really have to, because now um, I heard a story about the madam, the the woman who came from Ibadan, and she was talking about her 18-year-old, you know, I felt it. I felt her pain, and it just moved me from my seat. I said I was going to come forward, because I also want to see her at the end of this, you know, uh, so that What's we could question? talk more. Question. Okay, What's now question? my question is, is there anything that is being done for people who can afford to go to mainstream schools, who can afford to pay for professionals to take care of those children? Because we have children... In the motherless homes, I can remember the three-year-old who could not do anything. They kept calling him a special child. I didn't know he, he was an autistic child. So is there anything, like, um, is there a special organization or forum or professional training or a particular organization that just takes out time and says, we want to take care of children who don't have any kind of support. We want to render ourselves. We want to have a day for those children, okay. you know, so that they can have an opportunity to also have this kind of special you know, consultation. So your question is, what, what, what resources are there for what those What resources who, are there for, you those know, who, for those who cannot afford any kind of mainstream? Yes, she wants to ask. Well, there are different developmental deficits, okay? So you have the Down Syndrome Association, you have the Cerebral Palsy Association. Okay? And you have some parents uh, initiative for autism. We have a couple of people. You have Patrick Speech and Language Center, Pure Souls Foundation. Okay? These are different organizations providing support. So if you know anyone that needs help, you can come truly when you do developmental disorders. And what we look at is we're looking at it in different spheres, service research, um, advocacy, and then they hold it. Every year we, we have trainings that we run for the Lagos State uh, schools, the, the teachers who work with people with special needs, to get them up to speed and all of that. And even when we're not running those trainings, we have a relationship with them if they have any questions that the parents who need the services can get them. Thank you very much.